Nowadays, accessories can give you more information about yourself than you've ever had before. Powerful information for if you're trying to fulfill a New Year's resolution. But this is also the age of big data and targeted advertising. When Google bought Fitbit, they did promise they wouldn't use the personal information for advertisements for 10 years. So where exactly is this future of wearable tech going? Oh, we need to decide whether we're going to be prisoners or whether we're going to be free. Welcome back to Technality, I'm Jacqueline Swan, and today, getting to know yourself is easier than ever. Because nowadays, your phone is only an app away from helping you understand your diet, your sleep patterns, and habits. Add in fitness trackers, and you now have more intimate data to monitor how you function. Much like a cell phone, there will probably come a day where everyone is using wearable technology. However, this tech is often created by massively publicly traded companies who make money off our data, and they don't always use it with our best interests in mind. Now, I don't think we should be afraid of wearables. They have a massive potential to better society, and we can't exactly stop it from happening. The wearables industry is projected to reach about 180 18 billion dollars by the year 2028. So to understand where this near future is going, I needed to reach out to an expert. And thankfully, I live near the father of wearables himself. This is Steve Mann. Don't let his last name fool you though, he is a cyborg. And if you're wondering why he's in a bathing suit, he invited me out to a swim meet in Toronto. There, he uses wearable technology to monitor his heart, live stream video, and even map out the area so the group can avoid hazards in the water. But why is he the father of wearables? Well, in 1978, he invented the digital eyeglass, which may remind you a bit of Google Glasses. And for over 40 years, he's worn versions of this iTap device, going so far as to have it on his driver's license. In my mind, that is official recognition that he is a cyborg. So being the expert, he explained to me how technology and humans intersect. And even though we were on a public beach, in classic professor fashion, he showed me on a chalkboard the humans inside the technology that's wearables or we have the technology inside the human that's implantables or we have the human computer separate which is traditional human computer interaction now yes let's go for a swim well he was swimming i chickened out on the beach because the water was too cold. However, I think this is the perfect time for a quick media philosophy lesson. Prominent media theorist Marshall McLuhan said that technology is an extension of the human body. Just think of your phone. What started out as a block connected to your house by kilometers of wire now fits in your pocket and can connect you to almost anyone in the world instantly. This is normal, almost expected. If you've ever been without your cell phone, you might feel like a piece of you is missing. Because as society has adapted the cell phone into normal life, it has become an extension of how we normally interact with the world. The next step is to further incorporate this into our lives. And that looks like wearables and implants. And this is the reality Steve embraced a long time ago. There's, there's a, a future that we face of morphological freedom and morphological imprisonment. Like nowadays, people say Zoom me or Skype me. We didn't say someone was coming in by bell. We said they're coming in by telephone. There's a genericity. But now we've got this world where you Skype someone and you have to be using Skype to connect. So you have to have a particular brand where one brand doesn't talk to another. Imagine a piece of paper that only works with a big pen and it won't work with any other brand of pen. If you could build a piece of paper, you couldn't write on it with any pen except a big pen. Or a piece of, of paper that you could only write on it with a Crayola crayon. And imagine if it was brand specific like that. And that's what we have with Skype. You know, you're going to Skype me. And I have to be using Skype to receive your call. And so that's a form of prison. It's an imprisonment within the Skype prison system. It's like this this sort of evil world where you have to use a certain brand in order to, to connect. You live by their rules, it's, it, it, it's take it or, or, or leave it. 
by their very nature, wearables are going to shift how we interact with the world. When everyone has a camera and the means to share what they're witnessing, it's easier to hold those above us accountable for their actions. But it's also easier for them to monitor us. Steve actually broke down why this is a shift we should be aware of when it comes to wearables. Surveillance, sir means above or on. Surveillance is under sight. The way that surveillance works is the police watch us and then the chief of police watches the police and then maybe the mayor watches the chief of police. And you can imagine some kind of hierarchy, right? But what we often need is undersight. We need a congressional undersight committee. So at its simplest level, surveillance is just the you know, ordinary people watching the police. That's kind of at a superficial level, but I think it's a deeper concept in the sense that it's also understanding what's happening. And so surveillance and surveillance are these sort of political construct. Surveillance is a political construct. Sur means above, it's, it implies hierarchy. So as soon as you say surveillance, as soon as you, you, whether you're against or in favor of surveillance, it's a political game. One question is how, to what extent are these things self-chosen? You know, all this kind of implantable things may be partly driven by what we call the bigs. And there's also the individual freedom and choice. And so I think what we're going to really be looking at, the most important thing we as a society are facing, I think, is going to be this interplay between surveillance systems and surveillance systems. So on the one hand, this, this implantable might be another form of surveillance. It might be another form of tracking the bigs keeping track of everyone and a centralization of power and control. Or could it be surveillance where it's a distributed source? And I guess that those decisions are kind of up to us. We're at a precipice, we're at a pivotal era where we need to decide whether we're going to be prisoners or whether we're going to be free. As Steve said, we're at a precipice and wearable technology is just starting to become a viable option for everyday people. It is already becoming a part of our society and shifting the way we're interacting with the world. But we're still near the beginning of the adoption of this technology, which shouldn't be a bad thing. Technological advancements are meant to improve our lives. The data we can collect and the ability to share it almost instantaneously should be a benefit for society. The issue comes when central bodies control the how of how we use it. Imagine if your iPhone could only call other iPhones. Android phones already can't initiate FaceTime calls, so it's not that out there. Now imagine if the only way you could pay was having a microchip installed in your skin. In a perfect cyborgian world, you should have the option to not need technology to function. So as we adapt fitness trackers, computer glasses, and implantable wallets into our daily lives, we need to be cautious of who is behind this technology and how they're letting us use it. I would love to hear your thoughts in the comments section below. Are you excited for the future of wearables? Do you already own one? Or do you just want the option to live your best hermit life off the grid? If you enjoyed this video, give it a thumbs up. And if you want more content about where your future is going, subscribe to Technality.